take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, and I'm going to try to not keep you too long tonight, I hope you'll stay tuned in for the whole message. I've got a simple question I'd like to ask you, and I'll explain that here in just a second, but my question for you is do you have a testimony? Do you have a testimony Amen. of salvation? If you've been tuning into our Sunday morning services here, uh, as we've uh, been live streaming those as well, you know that Pastor Spurlock has been asking uh, folks in the church congregation to give their testimony uh, prior to him preaching. If you've been watching those, I know that they've been a blessing to you. But folks have been getting up and they've been testifying about how the Lord, how they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And tonight I want to ask you the question, do you have a testimony? Uh, in Acts chapter 26, we won't take time to read this whole chapter. But in this chapter, the Apostle Paul is standing before King Agrippa. You see in verse 1 there that... Uh, it says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And it says, Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. And the apostle Paul begins to talk to King Agrippa, and beginning in verse 9, he begins to give his testimony about how he came to know the Lord. And he recounts the events that, that took place in Acts chapter 9. Now you get down to the end of Acts chapter 26, and... Uh, you look at what King Agrippa said to the Apostle Paul here in chapter in verse in chapter 26, verse 28. It says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now the thing about that is this. The Apostle Paul was standing before a king. Now if you think of uh, uh, a president or you think of someone who is in a political authority, Political position, but this was a king. This is a this is even more powerful than a president. Uh, this man was a king, and he had all the power that he could have uh, physically or uh, politically. You can imagine. And the apostle Paul was a was a very smart man. He was an intellectual man, and he didn't get into a theological debate with the with King Agrippa. He didn't uh, uh, argue with him about politics. He didn't argue with him about any uh, theological questions. He simply gave him his testimony. Now that's, it's important because uh, that helps everybody because if the Apostle Paul who was probably, we could argue, was the greatest Christian in the New Testament if the Apostle Paul uh, used his testimony before a king, certainly any Christian who has a testimony can be a witness by simply giving their own testimony. When you testify, yep. you're testifying Amen. with what you've seen, what you've heard, what you did, what you've experienced. And you look through uh, verses 9 through 18, and you find the Apostle Paul, he told what his life was like before he got saved. He was a persecutor of Christians. The Apostle Paul was a persecutor of Christians. Matter of fact, he probably had Christians killed uh, in his line of work that he was doing. He told what he was before he was saved. He told how he met the Lord. He told about the light that shined from heaven, and that God spoke to him. And he told about what happened after he met the Lord. He gave him his testimony. Uh, this evening, before I, I get into asking you about your testimony, I want to give you mine. Uh, I have to say that I, I grew up in a privileged home. Now, anymore, when you say you grew up in a privileged home, people think that you are talking about money. And uh, But I can't say we had money. My family never had money. Uh, but I grew up in a Christian home. That's how I was privileged. Amen. I grew up in a Christian home. As far back as my mind's eye can remember, uh, my family was always in church. My mom and dad, my sister and myself, we, were, we always went to church. I heard the Bible stories uh, over and over. Uh, I was taught about Jesus Christ. And I had a very real knowledge of what the scripture said because I'd, I'd been through Sunday school and, and church and sat in preaching. And I heard those stories and those messages. So I had a knowledge of what the Bible said about salvation and how to obtain it. Uh, but at one point in time in my life, you know, I grew up and I, 
I had that knowledge, and I just assumed that I was a Christian. But at one point in time, about, I don't know, it might have been nine or ten years old, <clears throat> somebody asked me in church, I don't remember if it was my dad or somebody else, I think it was at another church if I remember correctly, somebody had asked me to give my testimony. You see, as a young Christian boy in a Christian family, uh, you know, I didn't get into a whole lot of trouble. Everybody thought I was just a good Christian boy. And they said, Pete, we'd like you to give your testimony. And I'd never been asked to give my testimony before. And, uh, you know, I had to think about it. I, I had to, came to the realization that I didn't have one. I didn't have a testimony. I knew about the Lord. I knew things about the Lord. But I didn't have a testimony. So I did what every uh, smart Baptist preacher's son can do. I made one up. I made one up. And it sounded good. Nobody doubted it. But I made one up. And from that point in time on, my, in my mind, there was always this lingering doubt. It was really conviction of the Holy Spirit of God uh, dealing with me about my salvation. Because I, I reasoned to myself that certainly I was saved because I knew the right answers. I knew, I knew that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I, I knew that. Here, I, I understood that from the scripture that that was the Bible said was the truth. So I reasoned that certainly I had to be saved because I knew the right answers. Uh, there was times in the, in my youth in a Christian school where I rededicated my life to the Lord, and uh, because I thought that's what I needed. And, you know, if I rededicate my life to the Lord, I'll be okay. But still, there was a lingering doubt. I I had already been baptized in a church. And, uh, you know, I, for all intents and purposes, uh, everyone thought that I was a Christian. But on a Wednesday night in May of 1984, uh, my dad preached a message in a uh, little storefront building there on Sandy Lane in Surfside Beach, South Carolina. The message he preached on that Wednesday night was out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that thing kept hitting me over and over again as I listened to that message. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. And I never really had a good holy fear of God. And it was at that time, and I can't remember all the message that he preached, and I don't remember that, but I remember I remember the fear of the Lord is the beginning. That thing kept hitting me, and that was the first time that I knew that Peter David Shear Jr. was going to die and go to hell without Jesus Christ, and I knew that I had to be born again. Amen. And even though there was no invitation given that I can remember at that time, uh, when we had closing prayer, I bowed my head and I prayed and I asked the Lord to save my soul and to, to, to save me. And he did. He did. Uh, that night, I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I can remember getting into our, our, our station wagon. My parents had a Chevy Malibu station wagon and uh, had bench seats. And, and I remember they got into the front seat and I was in the back seat. And I kind of put my arms up on the seat between them. And I said, I got something to tell you. And they said, what? And I said, I got saved. Amen. And uh, I remember they were excited. They were glad for me. But I, I got a question. What about you? What about you? Do you have a testimony? If someone was to ask you, hey, could you come and you, could you stand before this congregation and could you give us your testimony about how you came to know the Lord? Would you have a testimony? Would you have a testimony? You might say in your heart, well, I believe in God. You might even believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says the, the devil believes. Right. The church. Have you been born again, though? That's the question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Now, there's a lot of people that would want to tell us of their great works. And there's this, boy, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a very false teaching. It's a, it's a damnable heresy is what it is. There's this idea.
idea that people have, and I don't know where they've got it other than from the devil, and some false prophets, that there's this, there's this idea that people have that they're going to stand before God and God is going to weigh their good works and their bad works, and as long as their yep. good works outweigh their bad works, they'll be okay. The Bible says, for by grace you be saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You cannot get to heaven on your good works. Uh, some of us, some would get up and they would tell us that their family's history. Well, my my papa was a, a was a was a preacher. My great papa was a preacher. My dad was a preacher. I've been in church all my life. Well, you know what? So was I. So was I. I've been in church all my life, but you know what? Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Right. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter three. Ye must be born again. You see, your first birth doesn't do anything to get you to heaven. You've got to be born again Amen. through Jesus Christ in order to be saved, in order to go to heaven. You've got to have a new birth. You might try to convince yourself that you're okay with God, but I guarantee you, if I was to ask you if you could give your testimony of salvation, and you don't know right now how you would give your testimony. If you don't know, deep down inside of you, you know there's something missing. You know there's something wrong. And the problem is you've never personally dealt with your sin. You've never personally dealt with Jesus Christ about your sin. You've never been born again. Some of you are trusting your baptism. Pastor Spurl, I mentioned it this morning. A lot of folks think that they get in the baptismal pool and they get dunked under water that somehow that's going to make them right with God. Let me tell you something. I don't care how many times you've been baptized. All you've ever done when you got baptized is get wet. Yep. Amen. The Bible says you've got to be born again. If you're trusting your baptism for salvation, you're trusting the wrong thing. Amen. Some folks trust their church membership. Some, some folks trust their, uh, their catechism and their, uh, their education, Christian education. Some folks trust their religious acts. Some folks trust their kindness. They think because of their kind and good person that they're going to be accepted with God. You hope that your good will outweigh your bad. Let me ask you a question. If you could earn your way to heaven, then why did Jesus Christ have to die? Pastor Spurlock this morning brought a great message and he talked about the the must of the cross, how the cross was essential. Jesus Christ had to die. He had to make an atonement for sin. You see, it doesn't matter how much good you do, your good works will never alleviate, never wash away your sin. Right. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, John the Baptist saw him coming and he told those folks, he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. See, the problem is your sin. The problem I had was my sin. Our sin is what separates us from God. And you're not going to stand before God. You're not going to blame Adam and Eve for your sin. Your sin is yours. Yep. You chose to sin. Jesus Christ died, had to die because he had to, there had to be a sacrifice made for sin. He was the Lamb of God, the perfect spotless Lamb of God. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> look at verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10 he says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now remember that once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. Now let me briefly explain to you what he's saying there. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, those priests those ministers of the offerings there had to make those offerings over and over and over and over and over again. Because those offerings, though they, they offered a covering for sin, they did not clear away the 
the sin. He said those sacrifices which can never take away sins, those Old Testament sacrifices which were a picture, supposed to be a picture of the sacrifice coming of Jesus Christ and his offering for sin, the need for a blood offering, but they could never take away their sin. They just covered it, made the, uh, an atonement for it for that time. But when they sinned again, you know what they had to do? They had to make another sacrifice. Right. But Jesus Christ, this man, he says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Yep. So Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, came down to this earth to make one sacrifice for your sin and for mine, for the sins of the whole world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He made that sacrifice of sin for the entire world so that there could be one offering for sin so that you could receive forgiveness of sin and that your sins could be cleared away once and for all. Your good works cannot do that. No matter how good a person you might think you are, your good works cannot do that. Because Jesus Christ is the only person who ever walked on this earth who did not sin yep. against God. Amen. Amen. He didn't sin. <clears throat> now I know that there are some people who are hesitant to commit their life to Jesus Christ and trust Him as their Savior because they, in their mind, they reason to themselves. They say, well, Brother Pete, I'm afraid that I can't live it. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you a little secret? There's none of us that can live it. Right. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. <clears throat> this is something that takes place when you trust Jesus Christ. Now pay attention to what it says here. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you get saved, when you get born again, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you and Christ lives in you and he helps you live a Christian life. You can't do it on your own. Nobody in this earth, no, no physical human being can live a Christian life without the help of Christ. Right. Amen. Nobody can live. You've got to commit your life to Christ and trust Him. Now some of you are playing games. Some of you are playing games. You pretend on Sunday be a Christian. You pretend to be a good Christian. You might dress up in your Christian outfit and come to church and uh, put on a good Christian show for people. You might sing in the choir. You might even say an amen every now and then. And you do a good little show on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday you live like the devil. You live like you want to live. And you give no mind or thought to Jesus. You're playing a game. You're playing a game. Can I tell you this? Some of you want to hold on to your alcohol. You know if you get saved, you'd have to give that mess up. Yep. Now, I know there's some of you Christians listening and think you're okay drinking your alcohol. But you're living after the flesh drinking your alcohol. It Amen. has nothing to do with God. Right. It's a bad testimony. All right? And we could go through that time and time again. And I don't care what preacher tells you you're okay. I don't care what preacher drinks alcohol himself. He's wrong. He's out of the will of God. And so are you. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm telling you to love you because I want you to live for God. I'm telling that because I love you. And some of you are afraid you know you've got to give up your alcohol. I've had people that, uh, that I work with invite me <clears throat> to come to a little event they were hosting and everything. They'd, they'd say, now, Pete, I want you to know there's going to be alcohol. I said, well, I appreciate you letting me know that. Uh, but even if there is alcohol there, and if I do choose to come, I won't be drinking. But see, they knew I wouldn't drink. You say, why is that? They knew I was a Christian. Amen. How is a lost person knows that? Some of you Christians don't. Preach. Now, some of you.
you don't want to give up your alcohol. Some of you don't want to give up your drugs. You're afraid you can't do it. Some of you don't want to give up your, your fleshy sexual sins that you engage in. Yep. Can I tell you this? There is no sin. There is no pleasure on this earth that is worth dying and going. To Amen. When you stand before God at the great white throne judgment, that's where you'll stand before God if you're lost without Christ. At the great white throne judgment, you'll stand before God. And he is going to reveal to you the times and opportunities you had to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the times you held on to that sin, whatever it is. That sin that easily besets you. That sin that has a grip on your life. And you, you hold on to that sin. The times you held on to that sin and turned Jesus Christ down because you didn't want to let go of that sin. And you don't realize it. But God will help you get victory over that sin. Amen. Matter of fact, he says when you get saved, you have to increase yep. your victories in Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't hold on to your sin. Don't play games with don't go to hell for anything this world has to offer you. Right. The Bible says in Mark chapter 8, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I'll tell you what, there are people in this world who have given their life and devoted their life to making money. And boy, they're rich. They've got, they've got the wealth. They've got the nice house. They've got the nice cars. They've got anything that they want in this life that this life has to offer. Let me ask you a question. What good is it to have that for 60, 70, 80 years, maybe 90, maybe let's say you live to be 120 years old and you enjoyed every good thing this world has to offer? What good is that yep. if you spend eternity, not 120 years, not 100 years, not 80 years, not 60, not 70 years. Eternity. If you spend eternity in hell, right. what good would all the wealth of this world have to offer you? Right. Amen. Bill Gates may be a rich man, but if Bill Gates doesn't trust Jesus Christ as his Savior, his money will not get into heaven. Right. Amen. There might be some politicians whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, I don't care if it's Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi, I don't care what their name is. I don't care whether they have an R behind their name or a D behind their name. If they don't trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, they will die and go to hell for eternity. Amen. They will spend eternity in a burning lake of fire yep. because they fail to trust Jesus Christ. Amen. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world yet lose his own soul? What if you were asked to give your testimony? Can you give your testimony of how you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you have a testimony? The Bible is clear that there is only one way yep. to heaven. Only one way. Jesus Christ is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And the Bible says no man comes to the Father except by him. Take your Bible and turn to the book of John, chapter 10. John, chapter 10. Now, we've been listening to testimonies from folks in, in our church here on Sunday mornings. We heard a testimony from uh, Sister Leah Morgan this morning, and she was uh, along the same lines of me, grew up in church, and, and heard, the, heard the preaching and teaching of the Bible all her life, but she still had to come to a point in time where she trusted Christ as her Savior. She got saved at a young age. I got saved at the age of 11. And we might find that there are different stories about uh, people and how they come to know Christ. Some people uh, grow up in church and they get saved at an early age. Some folks don't get saved until later and they, they get involved in the things of the world and the sin of the world and God pulls them out of that. You hear all kinds of different testimonies. And there are different paths that all of us take. There are different experiences we all experience in our life. We all come from different walks of life and have different experiences. But the fact is, there's only one door. Only one door. Amen. And that door is Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 
verse 7, he says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Yep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and, and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Let me tell you something. The sin in your life that you think gives you such joy and satisfaction can never, never match the joy, the peace, and the satisfaction you'll get by having life through Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. Because he's the, he gives you life. He's the door. And it doesn't matter <clears throat> what your religious background is, you've got to come through Jesus it's not about taking a sacrament. It's not about being baptized. It's not about being a good person. It's not about being a member of a church. You've got to come through Jesus Christ. He's the door. He's the door. He's the only way to heaven. Do you have a testimony? Salvation is simple. It's really simple. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried That's the gospel message, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's the gospel message the apostle Paul preached. That's the gospel message that we are still preaching today. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried. And he rose again the third day. You must put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. If you are putting your faith and trust in anything else, if you're putting your faith and trust in the church, if you're putting your faith and trust in what your papa or mamma did, and that they were a good person, if you're putting your faith and trust in some religious exercise you did as a young person, or some uh, training you went through as a young person, or you're putting your faith and trust in an act of baptism, or you're putting your faith and trust in anything else other than Jesus Christ, your faith is misplaced. Yep. Because Jesus Christ is the only way. Amen. When you put your faith trust in Jesus Christ. He covers you <clears throat> with the blood of Jesus Christ <coughs> and he covers your sins, washes your sins away and he takes your sins and he buries them in the depths of the sea. <coughs> he covers them and he gives to you his righteousness. So when I stand before Jesus Christ I don't stand before him in the works that Peter Shear has done. I'll stand before him in the work that Jesus Christ has done. Look at one more verse of scripture here, Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, <clears throat> Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How about you? Are you saved? Have you been born again? If not, why not? What are you holding on to? Amen. What's, what's stopping you from trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior? One of the greatest things that stops people from trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior because you see, when you come to Christ, no matter whether you come young or old, you've got to humble yourself before God and say, Lord, I'm wrong, and you're right. And I need you for salvation. Don't let your pride hinder you from salvation. Don't let some sin that you love and you enjoy, don't let that keep you from being, being saved. Don't let that keep you from trusting Jesus Christ. God will help you get rid of that stuff. He'll help you. Right where you are, whether you're watching in your home, some vehicle somewhere, you might be in a park somewhere watching, I don't know where the, wherever you are. Why don't you call upon the Lord and ask him to save you?
pray something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know that my sin is going to send me to hell if I don't get rid of it. And I don't know that the only way to get rid of that sin is to trust you as my yep. Savior. Amen. I'm asking you, Father, will you please save me? I tell you what, if you pray something like that, it's not in the words you say, it's not in how you say it, it's a, it's a yielding of the heart. The moment you yield your heart and you surrender to him and you trust him, he'll save you just like that. You say, how do you know that, Brother Bean? I just read it. This book says it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe that? Why don't you do it? We sing a song. Not only trust him. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. Amen. And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Will you let him save you? The Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Do you have a testimony? Would you give your testimony of salvation? I hope you can. If you can, trust him tonight. Call upon him, and he'll save you. And he'll give you a testimony that you can share with others. Father, I pray you might take this message God, they would uh, surrender themselves to you. And God, that they would uh, turn, Lord, from the things that hold them in this world, the things that would hinder them, and they turn to Jesus Christ and call upon you for salvation. Please be with their hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me say this. If you give your heart to Jesus Christ, if you trust him as your Savior tonight, would you do us a favor? Would you message us on Facebook there somewhere? Send us an email somehow or another. Get in touch with us. Let us know that Christ the trip trust in Christ as your Savior, and we'd like to be a blessing to you. We'd like to know that. We'd like to hear from you. You uh, tune back again and again on Wednesday night, 7 p.m., with the Rodney Spurlock will be preaching this evening. Thank you for so much.